Welcome to Media Path. I am Louise Palanker. And I'm Fritz Coleman. Please take your seat, get comfortable, and as long as there are no children or pregnant women present, <laughs> feel free to sing, dance, vape, and grope along with our show. We are bringing you media recommendations plus our wonderfully charming guests from Empty Nest, the airplane movies, The Young and the Restless, Days of Our Lives, and a delightful bouquet of hilarious Zuzu commercials. David Leisure will join us. But before we get to David, Fritz, you've got something to share. I am so happy to share. You know, when we have goodies from the audience, it's always uh, humbling and wonderful. Yes. Although we're, we're a primarily an audio podcast, we do have a YouTube present where you can experience our show with all kinds of added visuals to enhance your experience. And not only that, it's a cool behind the scenes peek at our studio and what goes on in the recording of a podcast. The channel is growing quickly and we've gotten a great response to our recent video. So we want to read a comment or two. Here's one from our interview with Robbie Ben. This is from Lanage or Lanage, L A N A G. Lana G. Okay. How did How did you know that? I, uh, I, yeah, of I speak not. handle. Okay. Uh, Lana G. Thirty fifty one. Robbie Benson, like I've never heard him before. Wishing for eight days a week to be with his wife Carla DeVito. The gratitude for her and his life with her. Amazing. I agree. This interview was worth listening to again. Very informative. I met Robbie a number of times. He won't remember. I did see the performances on Broadway with the Pirates of Penzance with Robbie and Carla. I remember her stage chemistry. Uh, Amazing interview. Thank you. And a quick but to the point comment from last week's Simon Kirk interview. Simon is the drummer from Bad Company and Free. This is from Greg Hicks, 8497. Just stumbled into a great podcast Thank you. You can find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Media Path Podcast. And if you see this on video now, we would just love it if you would subscribe. And of course, if you took a minute to like or leave a comment, that would be wonderful as well. Thank you so much for watching. And Fritz, on my own personal YouTube channel, which is at Louise Palenker, I post highlights from our show with links back to our show page. And I included one where Robbie movingly extols the extended virtues of his lovely wife, Carla. And I received this comment from at Carla DeVito. Just saw this. Thanks for posting it, Louise. What's not to love, all caps, about my incredible guy? I'm the lucky one. All the best to you and Fritz, XOXO. And that's from Carla DeVito. I'll tell you, uh, uh, it it gave me goosebumps to listen to him talk about how important that woman was in his life. And, uh, you know, they've been married for 30 years, so it's not like this is all, you know... The BS detector would have gone off if it wasn't true. So. Oh, it's also true. Unbelievable. So, Fritz, what are you recommending for us? I- I'm going to talk about a book. You see it right in front of me here. It's called Blowback. It's a warning to save democracy from the next Trump. It's by Miles Taylor. Miles is anonymous. He was the anonymous who was the whistleblower who wrote the infamous New York Times op-ed that exposed behind-the-scenes secrets of the Trump administration by a person inside the Trump administration. Miles was a lifelong Republican who was the chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security. He was a national security expert and advisor to President George W. Bush. He was responsible for briefing President Trump once a week and was also close to the inner circle. He got to the point where he realized that the president was a threat and he wanted the world to know. Now, there's testimony in this book from other dissenters, including dozens of interviews with ex-Trump aides and officials. He describes all of the president's thankfully unfulfilled plans like war plans with other countries. He talks about Trump's pettiness. For instance, when John McCain died, I didn't hear this, heard this story. It just gave me, it, it gave me nuckus. Is that, what, what, is that what you call it? What you Spilkus. people call it? Spilkus. Okay. <laughs> John McCain died. Government flags were ordered to half staff, which incensed Trump. So he had them ordered back up to full staff. I mean, seriously. There's a great intrigue in how Miles had to go into hiding when the op-ed came out, along with the secret machinations it took to get the op-ed and his two books published. He describes death threats, his battle with alcoholism, his ruined relationships, all by trying to be honest with the American people. He reveals why people in in the administration who hated what they were doing didn't come forward. His theory is Donald Trump will be president again, even if he's not on the ballot. He looks into the future, how we would fare under a Trump 2.0. He says the White House will root out all noncompliant judges or will just ignore them. He talks about how legislative destruction will be used to remake America in the MAGA image. There's a quote in this book that reads like this. 
if we have another contest in the near future for our national existence, I predict the dividing line won't be Mason Dixon's, but between patriotism and intelligence on one side and superstition, ambition, and ignorance on the other side, which beautifully describes our current situation, except those words were spoken in 1875 by Ulysses S. Grant, which is pretty amazing. This is a great book. You'll, you'll love it. So how does Miles predict that Trump would be president without being on the ballot? Does that include violence? Trumpism. They just talk about uh, Trumpism. Trumpism. Yeah. Okay. He just thinks that, 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 you know, the rock has been turned over and we're just getting started. Okay. Okay. So, Fritz, I'm going to recommend a, a work, of, work of fiction, but it resonates. I'm going to heartily recommend Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. Demon Copperhead is a modern twist on the tragedy of systemic childhood neglect and abuse, which Barbara Kingsolver has set in southwestern Virginia, recognizing the parallels between the desperation of 19th century Dickensian London and the blight of our own American Appalachia. Kingsolver is well-loved for conjuring uniquely engaging voices in her first-person narratives, and she particularly shines with Demon, whose beautifully biting prose can illuminate the kindness of moss, God's flooring, or the hideous grip of opioids on a drained, damaged, and medically ill-equipped county. Here's an excerpt. What's an oxy, I'd ask? That November, it was still a shiny new thing. Oxycontin, God's gift for the laid-off, deep-hole man with his back and neck bones grinding like bags of gravel. For the bent-over lady pulling double shifts at Dollar General with her shot knees and ADHD grandkids to raise by herself. For every football player with some of this or that torn up and the whole world riding on his getting back in the game. This was our deliverance. The tree was shaken, and yes, we did eat of the apple. Demon's Lee County home is ripe with richly descriptive nicknames. Our title character is born Damon Fields to a teenage drug-addicted mother in a trailer in the late 1980s. His red hair and plucky grit inspire the name Demon Copperhead. Society places little value on this gifted boy beyond his ability to bring foster pay into a household, provide child labor, and run with a football. Pursuits which wreck his body as the adults in his immediate world offer only the immediate gratification of painkillers as a solution, and thus... The whole of his despair deepens and widens. The internet is eagerly collecting demon copperhead quotes, which, in the genius of Barbara Kingsolver, eloquently provide us with raw truths from the perspective of a dejected but resiliently funny, observant, and hopeful child. Here's my favorite. They wanted payback. I thought about what Rose said, wanting to see the rest of us hurt because she was hurting. You have to wonder, how much of the world's turning is fueled by that very fire? And I'll add, it's a fire stoked by interest which profit off of your rage. I suggest that when you feel it, you disengage. Think for a moment. This applies to friendships, work, work relationships, and politics. When you feel angry and hurt, redirect that passion away from what you hate and channel it towards what you love. Use your energy not to fight against a perceived enemy, but to fight for who and what you love and believe in. There is so much wisdom, humor, and understanding woven into a book about people who don't receive enough of our positive attention. Demon Copperhead is by Barbara Kingsolver. That's really wonderful. Yeah. It's, it's a fantastic book. She's just... What was that streaming series we watched about Appalachian that talked about high school kids? We just watched it recently, and we, we both commented oh, on yeah, it. Oh, yeah, it was on PBS. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it, yeah. but it was. it sounds like it's in that vein. Yeah, but the, yeah, but it's... Her fiction is just... She, she writes in first person. She writes as demon, and so you're there with him, and he is a funny, sharp, wise kid who, who gets it, and as he gets older, gets, gets it. In, in, with increasing depth and clarity. Love All right, it. we're going to welcome our guest, David Leisure. Yay! David Leisure played Charlie Dietz in Empty Nest, and he was the alternative facts floating pitchman Joe Azuzu for over seven years with 80 IMDb credits and counting. Please welcome to the stage, David Leisure. How you doing, David? One of the funniest people I'm ever. I'm doing great. Thank you. Many people wondered who bought the Unabomber's cabin, and David <laughs> now is... <laughs> <laughs> and David had a little electronic fireplace put in there. That really looks cozy. It's a little fixer upper. Tell everybody where yeah. you are, David. Okay, so I'm up in uh, Park City, Utah, I'm in oh, Deer Valley. Uh, you you are welcome to my man cave. This is the <laughs> one room I got to keep as my own after we remodeled our house. So uh, I was really into the cowboy and Indian thing, and so I parried it all down to one little section. It looks really cozy. Now you are you're the only person from the pilot of Empty Nest to make the series, but so explain because there's more backstory than just saying that because you were part of like the Susan Harris 
trilogy of can interwoven Miami themed. So explain for us. <laughs> wow, that is that's very good research there. OK, so um, about the third year in the show, I was walking across a set and I stopped in my tracks and realized what you just said. I was the only member of the original pilot to make it to the series. And so we had shot uh, a pilot with wonderful people, Rita Moreno, Paul Dooley, and wow. Jeffrey Lewis, Juliet Lewis's father, mm. great character actor, mm -hmm. and myself, more. And um, it was a 13-minute insert into the Golden Girls. So um, it was a one, it was like, I thought, well, this is, I've done, I had done so many pilots for NBC that never went. And I said, well, there's no way this is going to go. And I got the call. They said, okay. So I showed up and I was, you know, they had uh, Richard Mulligan, uh, Christy McNichol, Dinah Manoff, and Park Overall, and me. And I said, well, I was the only one. So, but we got a jump start because Richard was so beloved and he won an Emmy that year. It got us going really, really well on that on the show. So how are these people all connected? How, what what are you go on each other's shows? I'm, I'm reading your IMDb, and you're all on each other's shows. So how what's the conceit within which like you spun off in the first place? Oh, so uh, the spinoff was he's a doctor. Uh, he lives down the street. Mm. The girls come over. Uh, we do a little repartee, a little you know, a little uh, uh, a funny dialogue, and so that got us going on a new series where Richard Mulligan, he's a pediatrician, but they made him a widower. And the original pilot, Rita Moreno, was married to Paul Dooley. So they killed her off. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and uh, they got two daughters. And originally the daughters were out of the house, but of course they had to lay so much pipe. Pipe meaning they had to write reasons for them to come over. Mm -hmm. They moved them back in the house. So mm -hmm. it was all. Uh, originally emptiness, and it wasn't so empty after that. <laughs> Can I tell a, a, a Susan Harris story? Oh, please. Please. Okay. So, you know, she's with Thomas Harris, and they had the Golden Girls in, in your show and others and many mm -hmm. others. So every day on the 5 o'clock news, after I was finished the weather, I would do a thing called News Light, which was an amusing or odd story of the day. And one day I did a story about 2,000 physicians that were going to have a meeting in Miami. And their sole purpose of having this meeting for four days was to come up with a name for a disease, a disorder that made you feel tired all the time and for which there seemed to be no cure. So 2,000 doctors met for four days and the name they came up with was chronic fatigue syndrome. And I thought, wait a minute, it took 2,000 doctors four days? I could have come up with the name chronic fatigue syndrome if, if somebody had asked me, think up a name for a disease where you feel tired all the time and it doesn't go away. I would say, mm, well, chronic fatigue syndrome. So anyway. They need to send one writer to Miami rather than under doctors. That would have been great. And if Susan sent one, she would have been much happier with me because as soon as I talked about that, the phone went crazy up on the assignment desk because she suffers from chronic fatigue syndrome, which is... Oh, no. A, which is a, a real uh, disorder called... Um, something encephalitis Any, anyway it's a real thing right at, at the time it didn't seem real it's some people thought it was psychosomatic she called and tore my head off yes she said you have no idea and she said i want you to go back on the air either today or tomorrow and apologize for having done that of course i never did it but i thought oh my god it's susan harris she's got a couple of the most successful shows on nbc she's going to get me fired i didn't i never got oh fired. oh my gosh but, but, i would have just called it being 72 years old you know so. <laughs> at the time if i would have understood that feeling i would have that's what i would have done okay, but caffeine, anyway she caffeine deprivation syndrome she weren't no joke man she just lit me up on the phone wow it was very wow. interesting well i you know i didn't i had very few uh, dealings with susan uh, the only rule was don't mess with her words hmm. okay? ah. you don't don't change the words you don't change the words on susan's scripts Okay, so you never got chewed out. You worked with her and never got chewed out. Fritz not worked with her and got chewed out. So he's... That's right. Yep. Wow. Nice going, Fritz. I know. Man, I'm well done. She really had a special feeling for me. Well done. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you caught her in like one rare energetic moment. So that's man. That was your <laughs> yeah. Hey, so you grew up in San Diego, one of America's most beautiful towns. Yes. And went to San Diego State and roomed with another friend of mine, Robert Hayes, who's one of the world's yes. nicest humans. He's now living in Hawaii. And we went through that whole, his whole house burned down on Lake Malibu and just suffered God. an awful time with that. I know, and, I know. And, and, but he's just a great guy. I can see you two guys together as being great friends. Oh, you know, so we met in 68 in junior college and uh, we've been friends ever since. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's like one of those people don't believe it, but it's true. We've known each other, what, what's it, 50 years? It's a long time. <laughs> so, yeah, Bob and I go way back. So we were, you know, we did plays together, did all that stuff together, came to L.A. at the same time. And, you know, he took off a little quicker than I did because he's a leading man and I'm a character actor. So it took me a little while to get jump started. Well, talk about the arts in San Diego. They have a beautiful theater yeah. down there. The Globe Theater is like a country renowned theater. Did, did you start in local theater down there or? Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, there was a lot of local theater. So as you're doing your college, my, at least I was doing my college gigs, I was doing show after show in college, I would go over to the Old Globe and I did a couple of or three plays there. Bob was always the leading man and I was always the character guy in some other play. And so I must have, gee, I did, uh, I can't remember some of them, Pfeiffer's People and uh, the trial of the Catonsville Nine, that'll date me. And then from there, they had a legit theater in downtown San Diego. And so I started doing Lenny and Boys in the Band wow. and Pal Joey and a bunch of stuff. So then uh, that's where I sort of got my uh, union cards. And then I moved on up to L.A. Now, according to your Wikipedia page, you got the part in Airplane, not just because you were friends with Robert Hayes, but because you raised your hand when it came to who will shave their head. <laughs> yeah well Hare Krishna um, number I, one yeah it was it was sort of uh, serendipitous so they hired me and this other guy we, because we kind of looked similar we looked like we were brothers and we were willing to shave our heads so <laughs> see at the time I shaved my head but I didn't realize they would leave that little top knot a little <laughs> piece of tail on the top there so but I had a six month layover where I you know, wasn't working, but I had to keep my head shaved. Oh my God. And I was living in a very conservative area of Los Angeles, South Pasadena. And I remember going to the movies once with my wife and I forgot to wear my hat. Like I normally <laughs> wear my hat and I could hear all this whispering and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Oh, it's me. They're talking about me. Cause I got the <laughs> little, I look like a Hare Krishna. So when you moved to LA to begin your television career, is that where you mm -hmm. had to do what many actors and comedians do, sleep in your yes. Volkswagen bus? Yes, yes. Wow. I learned I learned how to live in a Volkswagen bus from Robert Hayes, by the way. So, <laughs> Cause he had a Volkswagen bus and I said, that's a good idea. So I got myself one, moved up to LA and uh, my very first job was Pizza Man on Sunset and Kursan. And uh, I delivered pizzas all over L.A. I used to know every single ad if you gave me an address in that area, I could tell you what side of the street it was and and give you the longitude and the latitude. It was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And who's hungry and who's not, you know, <laughs> at any given. Yeah, moment. Well, it was a learning experience back in those days. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. Uh, I oh, yeah, opened my eyes to a lot of a lot of aspects about the nightlife. <laughs> when they're hungry is key. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think uh, Joey Suzu, I can't remember what the years were for that, but seven years or something, yeah. um, is one of the most entertaining and iconic commercial characters in television history. It really has to be. The only guy I think these days who, th who, who would love to have your notoriety would be the guy who plays Mayhem on the Allstate commercials. He, he, would, he would try to be you, but he wasn't, because you were so funny and ironic, and that was such a great character. Also, we only had the three channels. That's so true. Everybody yeah. saw it. This is so true. You, yeah. You're nailing all these things. It's three yeah. channels, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so when you were on TV, you were on TV. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was back in the 80s. And uh, I got this gig and it was just, you know, it was a fantastic gig. It was like, it changed my life. It changed my life for the better. Uh, and now I am the mascot of a lot of people on Facebook. Really? I have a couple of 
couple of a couple of places where they take old Azuzu troopers and they trade parts and they talk about how to fix them and keep them running. Wow. I've got about 20,000 of my minions and their cult leader. Wow. wow. That See, is this so guy, big. this guy, Joe Azuzu, was fact checked in his own commercials. <laughs> Could we get that graphic? He's lying and just freeze it into every frame on Fox News. I think it'd oh, be yeah, extremely yeah. helpful. Yeah, yeah. He was uh, just they so had me running for president at one point, too. Did they? Did you so have weird. like gigs? I mean, did you get invited to do supermarket openings and that kind of thing? Appearances all over the United States? No, that 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 part never happened. I was strictly their boy. Uh, and doing their their bidding uh, for a number of years, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, I do have an interesting story, though. Uh, at one point, my agent said, I got you a free car. And I said, oh, okay, great. And so then she sent me a bill for 10% of the value of the car. Oh, so the second year, she said, I got you another free car. I said, okay, great. So instead of giving her money, I gave her, I went to the, the Zuzu dealership and I bought what would be 10% of a car and sent it to her office. <laughs> oh, that's so, so man, that, that's, that's like being a, she, a, a car winner on a game show where you have to pay the tax. That's the part. Well, it's just, it was, it's just, I said, okay, so here's 10% of a car. Cause yeah. I got a car. I didn't get money. Right. So I gave her wheels and a hood <laughs> and I think the back door. <laughs> what? All Go right, ahead. so I have a question about Azuzus. So you're saying there's there's Facebook groups of people that have these cars. Uh, so mm -hmm. explain to me the history of the car, and are they is the, it, are they no longer making these cars? Is that okay? So they okay. stopped making the cars years and years ago. Okay. And a according to whatever the car manufacturer rules are, they have to make parts for ten more years. Ah. But af after that, you're on your own. So they trade parts they trade stories they trade ways to fix them they trade how can i get this done and where can i get one of these things and there's it's very complicated and they're online all the time and occasionally i i chirp in and everybody gets a big kick out of it so when did they stop making zuzus was it acquired wow, by another good, company or what happened i th i think it was 2002 that they stopped they went out of business. They brought me back again in 2000 to save the company. And I didn't realize that they were trying to save the company. That's they a were heavy lift. Down. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and when you when you got cast, your producers uh -huh. said mm -hmm. they knew you were the man because you could lie like a pro. <laughs> I Yes, I was pretty good at it. I um, It's so funny because it was originally supposed to be John Lovitz because oh he had that God. character on Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. And and they own, but they only have 21 seconds to say what they need to say. And John's character was based on thinking slowly and then coming up with a lie. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't working. So they, when I walked in there, uh, they were all thinking, well, this isn't going to work until I walked in. And fortunately, all I did was smile in my very smarmy way <laughs> and talk. And they saw oh, he's perfect. You know, so it was uh, serendipitous. Yes, it was just like so elegantly obsequious. It was just adorable. Stop so, it. That's $10. I don't know what that word so is. So was your casting a blessing or a curse? Because the character you played on Empty Nest was kind of an irritating neighbor type guy. So it was in mm -hmm. you were on the spectrum of the Isuzu character when you when yeah. you Yeah, yeah, I'm on the spectrum all right. So I always said my acting ability goes from uh uh, lying, smarmy to obnoxious, moochie. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's range. Yeah. Yeah, that's a range, right? Yeah. That's a spectrum range. All right. So, David, are you willing to play a game that we call IMDb Roulette? I say an IMDb credit, and you tell us who you played and what you remember about your time on the set. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. So, we'll, uh, all right, let's do it. Let's see what happens. So, oh we'll God, start with your. Play, this, but go ahead. Okay, so this will be easy because we'll start with your first IMDb credit, which is First Krishna. That is what your. That is how okay. it reads in the Airplane. First, first Krishna. So, what? Tell us yeah. what happens on the set. Uh, you mean in actuality on yeah. the set? Okay, so uh, the first day on the set, I'm sitting next to Lloyd Bridges, and mm. he's getting a haircut, and I'm getting my head shaved. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Are you sitting That's there thinking, cool. how am I here? 
with Sea Hunt. It was so exactly, exactly. Lloyd Bridges and Leslie Nielsen oh, and Robert Stack and uh, Bob Stack and I became friends and oh. we played golf together. And uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar. By the way, when I stand up next to him, I'm looking right at his belt buckle. He's yeah. so tall. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, uh, I, I never understood, like the Zucker and Zucker, the Zucker brothers that came up with this great mm-hmm. format, Naked Brilliant. Gun and, and the Airplane. Why is that format? You don't see movies that have like the joke every 15 seconds. They were so funny. And they hold up now. They're funny as heck. You can't stop laughing at them. I don't know why they, they don't were, do something in that format. They were absolutely brilliant because the Paramount Studios wanted them to hire comedians and funny people and they said no 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 you don't understand Mm -hmm. we want bob stack Mm -hmm. we want Mm -hmm. straight guys Mm -hmm. and just say the words and because what they wrote was so ridiculously funny yeah it it, worked great yeah it was like deadpan without having to work at deadpan because it didn't have to work yeah Yeah. exactly you're exactly right all right so number two is alf now you're in two episodes of alf and this is what i call hashtag range you play in episode, in your first episode, you played Brandon Tartikoff, and in your second episode, <laughs> you played no Nikki way. the Fish Mints. So I would imagine <laughs> those are two very different characters to portray. I, I was, I mean, they apparently they liked me, so they brought me back again. So I was playing Nikki the Fish. Was it the Fish? Yeah. And uh, so I was like a, a, I was a like a bad guy crook who had a nasty cold. Mm. that's all i remember but brandon <laughs> tartikoff i remember that i was i was talking about uh the bill cosby show and his ratings had gone down because alf had jimmied the uh rating system so <laughs> oh, something poker party would get a really high rating because he liked the poker party <laughs> <laughs> alf gonna alf right mm-hmm. so <laughs> all right in the golden girls you play charlie Yes. So talk about working with those four iconic ladies. Oh, my gosh. Uh, boy, they're so, they were just fantastic. I mean, all of them were so professional. All of them knew how to nail a line. And they were just just it was a, a it was a, a privilege to work with them. Also, they had the best craft service table mm. you'd ever seen. <laughs> so I was always sneaking over to their set because this thing was a mile long and anything you could possibly imagine was on there. So I would go over there and flirt with them so I could steal their food. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I imagine cheesecake was included, right? They oh, said yeah. that you guys, Empty Nest, because it followed Golden Girls at 930 on Saturday night, was mm-hmm. a time slot hit which might have been true at first, but then you evolved beyond that because when Golden Girls and Empty Nest were run in reruns, Empty Nest ratings were actually higher than Golden Girls. So you had carved oh. out your own planet by that time. Well, that's that's quite a compliment. I mean, let's face it. You get a number one Saturday night show as your lead in, people are going to stay on the air. Mm-hmm. Also, like I said, Richard Mulligan mm-hmm. was beloved of people, especially because he was coming. He hadn't been on TV since Soap. Mm-hmm. He came back, wins an Emmy, wins a Golden Globe, and we were off and running. It was it was quite the boon. Okay, uh, number three, or number four. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'm not yeah. good at counting okay. or anything that involves numbers. Number four. I'm not counting. You play yourself in Blossom. How does that happen? You know, I... I don't even remember being on Blossom. <laughs> Confession. I do not remember that at all. Must have been a so, huge paycheck. Uh, you got me. You stumped me. You got me. I don't remember that moment or when I did it, how it happened, what the show was about, anything. Well, how I, was I, had I? Joey Lawrence and Maya Bialik, and mm-hmm. it was that was a it was a sweet show. I liked I liked Blossom. What did I do? I it just I I'll have to more thoroughly. I was expecting you to know more of this answer than I would, <laughs> because it was about me. Yeah, <laughs> you see the problem. So right? we can, <laughs> I can do some research. I'll get back to you. All right, All right, number five, heart to heart. You play a costumed guest in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it was. I think my name was Oliver, which is ironic because my original pilot was Oliver, mm-hmm. and. Um, I, I think I was sneaking some food. What I do remember is talking to Stephanie Powers mm. for 
like it seemed like hours and she just charmed the heck out of me <laughs> and i'm going like i could see why bill holden would be going for her this this was an attractive vivacious engaging human being oh, i mean that she was charming yeah that's so cool okay so mm-hmm. number six this one i think you'll know you play roger wilkes in the young and the restless mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> that, was, that was pretty campy i was such a bad person and i think i was with uh marcia wallace adorable sweet bless a her lovely heart. lady mm-hmm. since past uh we had the great great time together i was a real bad person what were some of your misdeeds I think I was married several times to different women at the same time. And I was sort of a, a gigolo. I was trying to get money out of her. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, hey, just, you know, aping my real life. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you'll learn your lesson. Uh, yeah, not really. I've been married four times. So, in real life, yeah. But life is a class. So, hopefully, we mm-hmm. advance to the next. Mm-hmm. Yeah, level but I've got a cheat sheet on that one. Yeah, level of understanding. All right, so we're going to do a little empty nest trivia. We'll okay. see. How it, you were pretty good at IMDb. Real, the the um, lost time at Blossom, I think we're, I'm going to have to look into. Okay. Me too. Me so too. Uh, empty nest trivia. Number one, according to Rue McClanahan, Park Overall would spend her breaks doing what in the parking lot? Roller skating. That is correct. Wow. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, well, she started roller skating, and I thought it looked like fun, so I started roller skating with her. And um, but one day she broke her leg. Oh, and I was, I think that stopped her roller skating career. What but stage fun, did you go? We we go we we go into the different sets. We go all up and down, uh, Renmar Studios. We go we oh. pop in and out of all these people's, uh, you know, during rehearsals. Oh, that's so fun. It was really cool. It's like, it, by the way, it was so dynamic. There was all these with Thomas Harris shows. I mean, there must have been seven or eight going at any one time. And you, it was like such an energy that was going on there. It was like like back in the day when those studios would have like all the stars running mm-hmm. around and everybody's going back and forth and hanging out. And we would do the same thing. It was really cool. My first thought when you described that is like, I'm putting a GoPro on my helmet and I'm <laughs> going for it. That's going to look so cool. Ah, I wish we had those. Yeah. <laughs> Number two, Empty Nest was a sister show airing in a block with which other Susan Harris created sitcoms? We we know one, but there's also another one. Uh, it's a living? Is nurses. That the one? nurses. Herman's Head? Nurses. Oh, Nurses. Of course, of course, Nurses, of course. Yeah. Did that yeah. come on, and on I was on after? That show. I was on that show yeah. too with David Rush. Did that come on after? Uh... Was like I can't remember. I think it came on after. I'm not sure. Oh. But Nurses was great. Lonnie was Anderson. A... Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so Lonnie Anderson. <laughs> yeah. Her dressing room was next to mine, and I was in the middle, and Richard was on the other side of me. And they'd both come into my dressing room because we were all getting divorced at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And we, support traded, group. we traded horror story. Lonnie would talk about Bert. And Richard would talk about his, and I would talk about mine. Wow. That's so was cool. it? He, was that healthy? Was that healing? Was that? Did that offer comfort? Did you share attorneys? It was. It was, <laughs> it was kind of a bitch session, and it was. Uh, it was. I guess you could call it healthy. You know, <laughs> if you want to go that way. I mean, <laughs> anger is a is an energy, and you can use it either to bring yourself down or propel yourself into another direction. And I, I chose to do the latter. That's excellent. And also, I think men have a harder time talking about their feelings. So when there's, you know, at least one female present, sometimes that stuff comes to the surface more easily. Yeah, that's easy to talk in front of Lonnie. She was such a doll. <laughs> Still is. Yeah. Still is a doll. Number three, your character's name, you've already actually hinted at this, foreshadowed. Okay. Your character's name mm-hmm. was Charlie, but what was his name in the pilot? Oliver, yeah. Oliver. Yeah. I was a test pilot. Yeah. I got to tell you, I was really disappointed. So I'm so we're in Florida and I I got a leather jacket in the show. By the way, I still have that jacket and I still fit in it. But I had this cool leather jacket with a turned up thing. And I was a test pilot in the pilot. And then when we got back to the regular show, I was basically gopher. 
who worked on a cruise ship <laughs> in a moron. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 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 I guess I guess that gives them more license for you to be sort of like a yeah. just kind of a play, a player, mm-hmm. sort of like an yeah. operator. I, I, I can be a player, and I can be an idiot, and I can say stupid things, and Richard could kick me out of his house. It was yeah. perfect. So number four, B. Arthur would often storm onto your set to demand that your cast refrain from what personal habit? Chewing gum. So what? She hate. She could. She had a hundred yard radar, <laughs> and it was it was uncanny. She would. She could sense somebody chewing gum around a corner, and she would go after them. She hated people who chew gum. That's some kind of an OCD deal going there. What is oh, that? Oh, completely, completely. Man, but oh, the man. fact that she she would come over and say, I, I know you're chewing gum, and I want you to stop it. <laughs> wow. Would people and, swallow and, their and, gum? And, or? Oh, yeah. And B is a very powerful person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, just her. And I mean, and everybody, will, okay, okay, okay. You know? Wow. wow. It's interesting that she'd rather have the gum in her hand than in <laughs> that person's mouth. But okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh which two empty nest characters uh mm-hmm. which two empty nest cast members were also in soap? Oh well Dinah Manoff and Richard Mulligan. Mm-hmm. Very good. That's an easy one. That's easy. Yeah. So far you're ace- you're doll. acing this. Number six, can you name the very famous guest star who would pass away four days after filming his episode? Oh, Danny Thomas. Yeah. Talk Danny. About, talk yeah. about Danny. Oh, what a sweetheart. Oh, my gosh. It was great. It was, that was a tough, that was a tough week. That was a tough week, yeah. Tough on Tony, for sure. Was that uh, your connection to St. Jude's? Yes, it is. Um, but actually, uh, you know, that's not true. I have, my niece, uh, who was 11 at the time, got a brain tumor. And she got into St. Jude's for a special uh, treatment that only St. Jude has. So I went, I would go and visit her. And so when I was in Memphis, I went to the Zuzu dealers because I was still doing, uh, I was doing part two of Joe. Uh, And I got them to lend cars to the parents who were staying at the Ronald McDonald house. Nice idea. Wonderful. Yeah, it was great. But so that kind of kind of got me connected. And then and then I've given a speech several times about uh, my experience at St. Jude's, my my niece's experience. And she's great now. She's got two babies and oh. and happily married. And she's doing great. It's a brilliant business model. It's a brilliant business model. It's so wonderful and heartwarming. Yeah, yeah. And they share all of their information, all their uh, new uh, uh, techniques. And the ability to save these children's lives with everybody. Mm-hmm. They don't. They don't keep mm-hmm. anything close to the vest. They they share it. Mm-hmm. Now, when you started out in acting, you you present mm-hmm. as the kind of guy that did stand up, but I don't. I didn't see anywhere that you had done stand up. No, I tried. I tried at one time. That was not for me. I'm much. I'm much easier wrapping myself around a script where I'm not actually me out there, I'm somebody else. Mm. And that's the reason I got into acting in the first place, because um, I was a very uh, awkward, fat, clumsy person who got picked on a lot because I was overweight and fat. And then when I was 16, I lost 75 pounds. Wow. But I had developed a sense of humor as sort of a counterpunch self-defense. And so... uh, uh, that's how I got into And when I got into the acting class in high school, I went, okay, this is where I want to be. Because first of all, I didn't have, I, I could not be myself. I could be somebody else, pretend to be somebody else, mm-hmm. which was a lot more comfortable for me. I'm happy with who I am now. Yeah, go back, go back a little bit because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very interested in, in children and childhood development. What do you think it was that, that uh, compelled you to, <laughs> not be able to balance your movement with your calorie intake and then what was it that compelled you at the very young age of 16 to to take care of this issue um let's see. chicks well, chicks I, I, what's that chicks I just, women i was chicks. no 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 well you yeah, know yeah that's a that's a i was on my way to be an eagle scout when i was blindsided by puberty that's true 
But uh, when I when I got when I I don't know something came over me when I was fifteen and a half, and between my sophomore and junior years, I came back a completely different person, uh, weight wise. Uh, the emotional thing only took another. 50, 60 years to, to, to <laughs> so get into were, control. So you were but, using food uh, to soothe yeah. something. Hmm? You were using food to soothe something in your life. Oh, yeah. I was a latchkey kid. I'd come home, watch TV. Also, that's I, I watched a lot of movies when I was a kid, mm -hmm. just at home alone and eating the whole time, eating the whole time. It was sort of my comfort. And uh, it's, you know, it's sort of a, it's sort of a self fulfilling prophecy when you when you're not happy with yourself and you're overweight you tend to get even more overweight because you're not happy with yourself and the only thing that comforted me was more and more food i had i still have a sweet tooth but i'm in uh, for a 72 year old i'm in pretty good shape i you work out fantastic. every day oh yeah and, and i will tell yeah. you that for somebody your age to drop 60 pounds is quite an accomplishment for you to sort of at that young age buckle, yeah that was, a, that, was, down. that was a that was a big deal that was a big big deal did you read um, up on it or how did you approach it well it was let's see it's it's in uh what is it? it's in the 60s early 60s i think yeah mm -hmm. uh, president kennedy before that had talked about exercise and so I was really terrible at it. I was terrible at it. So I started, uh, you know, jogging and I went on a diet and I jogged and I, I started to get into shape. And, you know, I tried playing football, but I basically was just sort of a, a place marker. I was a big, huge, enormous, fat person. Just, you know, I was just taking up space and I didn't actually have any athletic ability. And so I quit football. And so, um, you know, I, I and they picked on me for quitting, too. And so I said, well, I got to do something about that. So that was kind of an impetus. Now you come to think of it. Wow. So that was kind of this. Uh, well, I'm quitting football and they're making, the, you know, they're they're badgering me about quitting. So I'm going to do so. I'm going to change my I'm going to change myself. And I metamorphosized into a thin person. I went down to. Gee, I was about two and a quarter. I think I went down to 160, 155, something like that. Good for you. Oh, that's really... And, and is the audience important to you in performing, or are you just as happy doing a movie where it's you meticulously parse out the role, or do you like the response from an audience? Well, it's great having an audience. You get that instant feedback, mm -hmm. and you know if something's working or something isn't working. Uh, a movie is a different thing, but there's a, also an energy on the set. There's a definite energy when I when I go to work. I really enjoy being there. It's it it it. I get bubbled up inside. I I start having a different kind of like right now. I'm talking to you. I got a different kind of energy mm. that I would if I wasn't talking to you. Mm. It's it brings me up, and I I really enjoy it. Now, when you when you were a kid, after you lost that weight or before you lost that weight, mm. did you go out for any of the theater stuff at school? Yeah, I immediately got into the drama department. So, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, 15, 16 years old, I get in the drama department. And at the time, um, it's, you know, there's no guys in the drama department. It's all girls. <laughs> and so I got into the drama department. And I called my buddy up. I said, you got to come over here. It's nothing but, it's nothing but women <laughs> or girls. They were women. They were girls. And so I said, come on, man. This is like, you know, it's like, it's kind of cool. So I made a lot of good friends, and I dated a lot of the girls in there. And a buddy of mine and I, we were both dating a girl from another high school. So we went to go see their uh, their high school play. And their high school play, they were doing Stalag 17 hmm. with an all-girl cast. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's the way it was back in those days. There was no guys in the drama department. Wow. Wow. Oh, so yeah. that's you know, progress. when Empty Nest got going, uh, mm -hmm. one of the ironies of that was you were not a press darling. That is to say, they didn't write a lot of positive stuff about Empty Nest. You just had a lot of viewers. So you were sort of underserved by the promotional press, but did well with viewers and sort of rode below the radar into great success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's a statement or a question? <laughs> no, I, I was just noticing that uh, because there's mm-hmm. another show we had a, a guest on who was the showrunner for Northern Exposure, which had exactly the same thing. Nobody was talking about it. Next thing you know, six seasons later, they're still cruising right along, you know? Yeah, yeah, we were on for seven years. That was great. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it doesn't hurt to have, uh, you know, the, the Golden Girls as you lead in. And, um, you know, you, you get a sort of a momentum and then you get a following. And uh, I don't know if today, you got to come out of the box pretty hot today yeah. mm-hmm. to yeah. stay on the air. Yeah. I mean, now it seems like three years and you're gone, but there's so much more content to watch across the board. And they don't get a lot of press. Like uh, one of my favorite shows, my wife and I favorite shows was The Great uh, and was on Hulu. Oh, yeah. But... But nobody, I mean, they got great press, they got great reviews, and they just decided to cancel it after two seasons. And I love we were that. very disappointed because we were waiting for the It was season. funny. It, it was a great show. Oh, yeah. Lovely show. Yeah, lovely yeah, show. Is very it, smart. Very clever. Is it true, because the internet mm-hmm. believes this to be so, is it true that B. Arthur hated <laughs> Betty White? Hmm. <laughs> you notice my... Yeah, apparently I just gave myself away by pausing so long. Um, they had some issues. They had some issues. Uh, they worked well together. Uh, there are some stories floating around out there about some sort of acrimony. And this is true of any cast, though. So did I get out of it? I yeah. think you did really well. <laughs> you know, uh, th- th- there was a couple of peak periods at NBC for sitcoms. And uh, yours was part of that when Brandon Tartikoff and then Warren Littlefield were in charge of the network. Those were good days and good creative days for sitcoms because Brandon was a funny guy himself and really knew what was funny. And, you know, those were good days. Yeah, it was. Brandon was I mean, he was my champion. Like I said, I did a lot of uh, pilots for NBC that didn't go. And it was because he kept plugging me in, plugging me in, plugging me in. And he was he was such a great guy. You know, he was a terrific human being yeah. and smart mm-hmm. and smart. Mm-hmm. And before him, you were talking about shows getting blown off the air. Uh, they had the, the Titans like Grant Tinker. And Grant Tinker was one of those people where if the show wasn't successful out of the box or for a season or two, he had a great instinct about what would work. Like St. Elsewhere and Hill Street Blues, he'd let them cruise along and they, it took them a couple of seasons to find their audience, but then they were off and running. Now, you know, you can do three episodes and your show gets jerked on oh, network this is television. Exactly what I was, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to say. Yeah. So I was in college also with Julie Cadner. And who wow. plays Marge Simpson, and yeah. she was Rhoda's sister on the Rhoda Show. Okay. And she tried to get me to be her boyfriend on her show, uh, Rhoda. And so I got an audition. I had to, to make up a horrendous story to get out of work. And so I <laughs> made up this big, huge lie about this something or another. And so I went there and to audition for Rhoda. And Julie was there. But I walk into a room. I walked through a door that didn't look like a regular door. It looked like it would have an ironing board behind it. It was so small. <laughs> and, but I, I merged into this huge room, and there was Grant Tinker and blah, blah, blah. And everybody from the show, there was about 25 people there and Julie. And I just about shit myself. It was really <laughs> tough. Wow. And I just tanked so badly oh. and julie was so nice enough to come running out after me he says what happened is julie i just i just jumped i was i was so intimidated i had no idea what i was doing but she's a doll she's a doll oh i'm a big fan so i want to ask emptiness was on before the internet so and and you guys as a cast had to address what what happened with with christy mcnichol which was that she uh, she was diagnosed bipolar and she decided to step aside do you feel yeah. like you with that you were able to do enough for awareness and help other folks to not feel so isolated and t- tell us what you remember about that period and how how it was handled oh boy that was so tough um you don't really know what you got until you lose it so yeah. christy left the show and i mean it was tough on us because she was you know, a major part of the show. Yeah. 
So to try to fill that gap, we had we brought in a sister that we only mentioned in passing in one episode <laughs> years before. And we brought in a husband for Dinah. We brought in another nurse and it, nothing seemed to work. Then we did the last two episodes of the final season and Christy came back for that. Mm -hmm. And it was like she was never gone. Oh, Everything oh. just clicked. Everything flowed together. And there was a moment when nobody was talking, but Victor, who was our, one of our prop masters, said what everybody's thinking in this sort of cavalier, nonchalant way. He said, so, Christy, where you been? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody went, oh, my God, he's right. It's And we started crying. I oh. mean, it was just one of those moments that you just think about and it happens. And mm -hmm. it was like, yeah, where you been, Christy? Because she showed up and it was like she was never gone. And that, just, and that was two years later. Yeah, but it, it kind of like helps us all identify what chemistry is, which is that it's ingredients. You are so right. You are so right. Uh, right on the money, right there. Yeah. And she was essential. Yeah, yeah totally. You know, they like to say to us, like, everyone's replaceable. None of us are replaceable. Mm, no. There's only one <laughs> of each of us. Well, what about all the reasons? Yeah, what about you all the think they're replaceable, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry? What do you think about all the reboots going on? Fraser and Night Court and Will and Grace. Fraser's just getting talked about now, but Night Court's doing well and Will and Grace are doing yeah. well on streaming. What, what do you think about all that? <laughs> well, I mean... I mean, your characters are missing. You, 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 I mean, you can't do it without Richard. It wouldn't be the same show. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, I mean, let's face it. Let's face it. They had... Night Court was a winner. Uh, Fraser was a super, I mean, they're all super shows. Mm -hmm. Will and Grace. It, how about that? They come back, jump right in there. I think Will and Grace is funnier years. in the reboot than they were in their re original run. It's hysterical. They're edgier now than they were before. E equally well, they awesome. got the, they, they got the, they had the opportunity to be a little edgier because times change a yeah, little bit. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, they were pretty good when they first. I was there for the pilot. I was friends with Jim Burroughs. Oh. He was directing. So he said, come on down, watch this. So he says, where do you see this kid? And he's talking about Sean Hayes, yeah. right? So I'm kneeling, trying to be uh, in uh, unobtrusive, just uh, almost invisible. <laughs> Sean Hayes walks on the set and does his very first scene. And my mouth drops open. I couldn't even laugh because I was so astounded by how good this kid was. And then I looked over at Jim, and he was looking at me, smirking, like, yeah, I told you so. I told you so. Wow. And he was right. And the, there's chemistry. Those yeah. four people, that, they hadn't seen chemistry like that since Lucy. I don't think we – that, that well said, David. I don't think we have, and I don't know if we'll ever see chemistry like that again. That they – it doesn't matter who's on the screen. Every scene is beautiful. Uh, that, yeah, that's, yeah. I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Yeah, because, you're right. We will. Because there's, there's, there, there's so many talented uh, people out there. A couple of months ago, one of my uh, close friends went to New York and saw Sean in Goodnight Oscar, the Oscar Levant show on Broadway, and said it's the greatest <laughs> piece of theater he's ever seen. Not only because wow. he, and, and this is a theater maven, you know, and, he, and at the end of it, Sean's like a uh, 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 he was a wonderkind piano player, like a like a Oscar was. No, no I'm not oh, Sean. Sean, Sean, Sean yeah. performs yeah. Uh, uh, Rhapsody in Blue, the entire piece of music at the end of the show, and they say it's just you can hear a pin drop in the theater. They said it's the greatest piece of theater they've ever seen. He's such a talented man. What a gift! Oh, I would love. I would die. I would love to see that. Yeah, I mean, the, the run uh, is over, but uh, but I hope he brings it out here. That would be unbelievable. Oh, that would be great. I would love to. See it. Oscar Levant was on the Dick Cavett show once, all the time, and yeah. it was just very close to the, to the end. And he came out, he must have weighed a uh, hundred pounds mm. and he came out smoking and he was really, really frail. And he, I think he had just had a, a, a stroke, mm. uh, a, one of many. And, and Dick Cavett looked at him and said, so Oscar, what do you do for exercise? <laughs> and Oscar <laughs> with, with, pulls a cigarette out of his mouth and blows smoke out without missing a beat. He goes, I get up in the morning and I have a cigarette and then I stumble and fall into a coma. <laughs> he was a very entertaining talk show guest. That is dark. He was, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was perfect. That is beautiful. Wow. 
Well, what else did you want to share with us before we close? You have been an absolute delight to talk with. I know. I'm t- yeah. pretty adorable. <laughs> Let me think. Um, I'm going to the Ryder Cup. For, if you have any golf oh, fans man. out there, yes, I, this yes. is a bucket list. Yeah. So my wife and I, we had, we had tickets to go, to, uh, to, to go on a thing, and then uh, we, uh, COVID hit. So we had to cancel it. So these round-trip business class tickets turned into a one-way coach. But we're going to go to Italy, and my wife comes up to me, and she says, hey, the Ryder Cup is going to be in Italy when we're in Italy. Oh my and I go, uh-huh. And so, do you want to go? And I said, oh, well, I would love to go. And who are you? And what have you done with my wife? <laughs> so I went on, you know, line and I got tickets. And so we're going to go to the Ryder Cup. And that's, that's going to be when really is cool. That? These when... are the best golfers in the world. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and you had to, you're going to follow the American team, right? Oh, yeah. I got I got... I got my Ryder Club uniform. I got my hat. I got, you know, I'm ready to rock. Yeah. Let's go. And maybe there won't be like a ton of Americans there and you'll get get to see a lot of really great stuff. Really <laughs> close up. I'm going to see a lot of great stuff regardless, but yeah. uh, there's going to be a lot of people there. I mean, this is a this is a, a, a different golf experience. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's on my bucket list and, and I get to do it. Now, this do they... So cool. How do they play? Do they play best ball? Remind me how they play. Okay, so they they've got a uh, a team yeah. thing. It's called four ball. So they got two uh, Europeans and two Americans, and they they play eighteen holes. And each of the two guys, they take the best of the two shots. And so mm. they, you try to beat the other team, and then they play a match play where it's one on one, and whoever wins the hole gets a point or whoever wins the match gets a point. So the Americans, so at uh, match play is like, um, like I win a hole, I'm one up, I lose a mm-hmm. hole, we're even, he wins a hole, he's one up, and you, you play 18 holes, and by somewhere along the line, somebody's a way ahead, and you know, you're done, you, mm-hmm. you won that match. So you get a point. Or if you tie the match, you get a half a point. So you gotta get to 14 and a half points, and you win the Ryder Cup. How many countries are gonna be represented? Woo. Let's see. You got England, you got France, Italy, Spain, Greece, uh, 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 Sweden, Holland, Belgium, and uh, I know I'm, I'm missing some, but America. So awesome. you got the best golfers from Europe and the best golfers from America. And so, who will and be We Ameri- have not won. We have not won in Europe in like 30 years wow who, who are the so americans re- teamed with the first time oh yeah, yeah. who's their part. match who their first matchup against? who is the first matchup with you for the americans do you know i don't know i don't know they just posted it i think yesterday or today so i'm gonna have to go figure that out but you know we've got some 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 big guns coming in there man it's gonna be so cool mm-hmm. are you can we follow you on instagram or facebook and wa- and watch you post photos of i'll post some stuff yeah yeah, yeah i'll post some stuff absolutely cool, i'm cool. going to be posting all right so where do folks find you online on social uh facebook it's uh you know david leisure mm-hmm. on facebook uh instagram it's also i think it's david leisure uh one one that'll do it yeah 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 that'll help yeah all right you know, that's, that's pretty complicated you know i'm a complicated guy we'll get you there we'll have the As links you can see. we'll have you are very complicated we'll have the links in the yeah. show notes here come your closing credits thank you so much for joining us we would love hey, to continue thank this you con- guys. thank you we would love to continue this conversation with you on instagram and twitter where we are at media path pod and on facebook where our show page is media path podcast and our facebook group is media path with fritz and wheezy podcast community you can find full video podcast episodes loaded with bonus visual content on our youtube channel at Media Path Podcast. And you can write to us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoy this show, please go ahead and give us a nice rating in Apple Podcasts. We would love that so much. You can sign up for our spicy little newsletter at mediapathpodcast.com. And we want to thank our wonderful guest, Dave Leisure. Our team includes producer Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, Lori DeWall, Garrett Arch, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. And I am Louise Planker here with Fritz Coleman. Be well and wise. And we will see. Oh, happy birthday. Birthday, Garrett. Garrett just turned 16. Woo-hoo. Come look at the camera. This is Garrett, our intern. Thank you. Garrett's going to be driving himself here mm-hmm. any minute now. Yeah, in a Tesla. 
And it's, <laughs> I am Louise Planker here with Fritz Coleman and Garrett Arch. Be well and wise, and we will see you along the media path. David, thank you so much. David, that was awesome. Hey, buddy. We're going to take our thank picture. You.